This podcast is sponsored by Relevant. It's a new iOS app to consolidate the media you want to see in a place you control. With Relevant, you stay up to date with things you're actually interested in. You tell Relevant what's relevant to you, and you'll be given all the content you love from all across the internet, all in one place. It's available on iOS devices and coming soon to Android. Be the first to know with Relevant. What's up, everybody? It's the Poorly Edited Podcast, and we're here live from WXLVDX on the Ultra C campus, and I'm joined by my lovely hosts once again today. We got... My name is Coffee Guy. My name is Patrick Lilly. I'm Chandler Davis, and we're joined with our special guest... David Hengeveld. And we got Josh Brennan on the camera once again today. He's got new equipment. New equipment. He's looking way more professional than ever, and uh, it's crazy. It's crazy out here. It, uh, but before we, we're, we're gonna we're gonna speak to Josh probably in a little bit. But um, before we get into that, uh, I'd like to ask, how was everybody's week? I don't remember. What did I do? Something happened. Good. I went to a wedding. I was at a wedding. Oh, did you get married? Yeah, was it Josh's wedding. Yeah. I got married. Oh. It was Josh's <laughs> wedding. Josh and I are married now. Um, I've, I've honestly been waiting for this for a long time, so it's it's been wonderful. It's been great. I'm glad I got, you guys finally tied. I got some pictures. They'll be on the gram. That's a thing now. <laughs> oh, that's right. I, it's popping, yo. Every day I'm putting stuff up, which I, is like a thing people don't do. Apparently, nobody what? puts pictures on their Instagram every no. day. But no, yeah, they do. Especially us. You mean the successful pages? They do. Well, yeah, but <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I finally. Peer pressured you enough yeah. to because it is your fault. We yeah yeah we we have a photography class together and you've been taking the sickest shots. Thanks, dude. And I've been seeing them over the course of the class, and I was just like, dude, can you please like I want to see them. Like I want to be able to see these somewhere. So you put make just make an Instagram or something, dude. It's like give me eyes, man. I did eyes. finally. <laughs> Take the blindfold off me, please. I just want to see them. Um, and it's been going cool. Yeah, I, I've enjoyed it. It's cool. It's it's something that's so easy to do every day. Yeah. And then if I want to do something like a little more serious, something harder, like a music video or something, I can just put that on there too. So it's not oh, well, like okay. what I'm saying is like, I don't have to like, I got to do something really difficult every week and make sure it's up. It's just, I'll do the yeah. pictures, which are really easy. And then occasionally something super cool. Are the pictures really easy? Because you put a lot of thought into some of those. Well, so I've taken a lot for the class so far. So yeah. I have oh, so kind have of a, a backlog. Yeah. And because I have to do it every week, it's always getting bigger. And then it's just, I pick the ones I like. And yeah. And what's your name on Instagram now? Uh, my name is Clapsync. One word. I don't get it. <laughs> it's a film joke. Well, that was actually one of the proposed names for... Yeah. Our channel, we're going to rebrand our channel too. I think who came with Sam came up with that. I believe that was Sam's idea. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's not credit her. No, lady. no, no. Yeah, that was dumb. Uh, now, my second question, really quick: What are you eating into the mic? Um, am I eating into the mic? Well, I think you're you're I, licking your lips a little. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know. It's just food they have here at the station. That's not. Good it's just like to some do. sort of dessert thing. Well, you I don't just, even know what you're eating. It it's looks all... good. It smells good. There's blueberries. It's like a muffiny sort of thing. Is I got that... some coffee here. It's. I'm having a good time. He comes dude. in and he just sees food and he's like, "That's <laughs> sure." I don't. It was that just laying out like unpackaged and stuff. It was on the floor. Yeah, I asked Chris <laughs> if I could have one. That's weird. All right. He went. Ah, yeah, sure. Pat, you're rocking a new shirt today. Also, yeah, I have to. Do you get the reference? No, all right. not at all. Let's move on. But then. it's a banana. It's very. It's, it's too happy for you. It's a smiling banana, and it's not a wombat's sweatshirt. So no, it's in the corner. Don't worry. It's oh. still here. Oh, not the, what? How was your week? Uh, good. It was alright. Yeah. Good. How about you, David? <laughs> Couldn't complain. That's exciting. Good and <laughs> uh, I know Saturday I was at a the DeSales Film Festival. Thanks for an invite. Actually, well, it wasn't like that. See, I was. I had a wedding anyway. Oh, well, because I'm uh, the, like, media assistant for the film professor, Baron here, she, it was like a thing through that, so, uh, and Josh is the president of film club, he was there as well, and tagged along, um, it was super fun, we had a good time, and the films that we saw were very, very well done by very talented and passionate students at the sales, and... Uh, it was just a, 
It was uh, it was definitely like inspiring. It's inspiring to be in an environment where it's all people who are in the exact same boat as you, you know, as a film major myself and Josh is too. Uh, you know, we're just sitting there watching this all this work by people, you know, of our age and you know, they're also hungry college students just wanting to make it and it's uh it was just a really inspiring environment to be in watching. And there was even a documentary that opened the show that one of the students did that talked about how essentially the struggles of being, it was very meta in the sense of how the struggles of being a, a college film student and, and things of that nature that hit pretty close to home for both of us and yeah, scared us. Yeah, it's yeah. a struggle. <laughs> Josh is in the most awkward, uncomfortable oh, man, position right now. Uh, okay. One handing his heavy camera with yep. his uh, what's that called the stabilizer? Uh, no, it's not a stabilizer. It's just like a cage for a DSLR. Good. Don't even I don't even know the brand to plug it to be completely. Honest, so, <laughs> what did you think about the the show? I loved it. It was um, on a more serious note. The uh, every every single one that we saw was just incredible. Like like the the amount of work that went into each short film was just astounding, and that's very evident from just watching all of them. So both Chandler and I were very impressed. <laughs> Um, it, it was interesting because I'm, I'm going to set this down. I can't, do <laughs> I can't talk. We'll, like, use the other, yeah, we'll use the other one. Um, it, it was interesting to see like the different, oh, sorry. It was interesting to see like the, the different sort of styles too, because like it was pretty evident like that some people had interests in different areas, um, in terms of theme too. like case in point, like I would say nine of the 10 that we watched were like on, were all very serious or, or on a, or thematically they were talking about a subject that was serious. And then, like, the very last one that we watched was, like, it was, like, a Game Grumps video. It was insane. It was, like, it, the whole thing was, I was dying. I yeah. was literally in tears yeah. the entire time from laughter. And so I found it interesting to see sort of that all of them clearly were very, very well done. There was a ton of work that was poured into all of them. But at the same time, there's room for, like, personal uh, touches. Like, it is very clear that they were all, like, passion projects. Too. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, and we were talking after of just the, the overwhelming feeling of uh, those people are all there were so many people that, that were some of them directed at, while producing another one of the same films that was up in the contest and acting in another, you know, like so many people had so many different hands in all the different projects. And it was just like we were sitting there. It's like, oh, we are not <laughs> we need to step our game up. Like these people are are. And one of the the quotes from the opening documentary Mm -hmm. about uh, director James Cameron was, you know, on the subject of when people say they don't have enough time, uh, they said uh, James Cameron was directing Terminator 2 while writing the script for Aliens. And so it's like, if you think you don't have time, like, there's always time. You always make it happen. Yeah, that first one really hit close to home both of us were like kind of like slouching in our chairs like oh yeah because it was the the whole point of it was just like how do you stand out in an industry that is so saturated with people that are i i I don't mean to like dehumanize people but essentially like just like you you know i think a lot of filmmakers go through that which is just this like overwhelming sense of like how on earth do i stand out if the unique me is like almost like everybody else like how do i make my mark in an industry that is just so saturated with people that want to do the exact same thing that i want to do and it was a really well well well-made documentary and and some of the things i would say the biggest thing that was hit on like you said chandler was you just got to work and you just got to work your butt off just like work more than you think you possibly can work more than everybody else and and that goes back to that that quote about james cameron who was what you said he was writing Terminator while directing, Dir- directing, directing Terminator, Terminator to... while writing Aliens. Yeah, yeah. That's insane it how is. much work that is. Yeah. And so both of us were kind of, kind of, it was like a knife to the heart for both yeah. of us, I feel like, which, I mean, that, that's good to be challenged, right? You know, that, that inspires us to do more. So it's Absolutely. definitely, definitely an awesome documentary. Yeah. And just don't quit. That was the other yeah. thing, yep. which is really easy to do. It's really easy to quit. I remember. And, I've come close. Yeah. <laughs> I can tell you for sure. I don't know how this show is even still going, to be honest. <laughs> Uh, one of the kids also was, was saying, uh, in one of the interviews, like, you know, back home before he went out West to film school is like back home, he was the video guy and he was the guy everyone came to, to do video stuff or to edit or film something. And then he, he leaves his hometown to come out to LA and now he's with hundreds of other people who are those people from their hometowns and they're all in one place and they're all the same now, you know, it's what made him stick out back home. But now that he's here, everyone's like him. So how's he going to stick out now? Like what's his thing now? You know, so it gets, 
the further you go into it, the harder and harder it becomes to stand aside and and all that. So yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, and, and going off that too, the, the, the college kid that you were talking about, I think at the very end of that interview when he was talking about how he used to be the video guy and now he's with people that are just like him, he talked about how challenging that was and how it inspired him just to do more and work harder and, and to, to stand out. So I, I think that that's... That that's definitely like a good life lesson to, to take home. That like, yeah, you you do when you, when you challenge yourself in this industry, you you have to put yourself or surround yourself with people that are just like you, but also you kind of spur each other on. I, I guess spur each other on to greatness is a good way of saying it because you kind of like push each other to to do more, and and so it can be discouraging for sure because you're just like, how like how do I do this? But at the same time the people that are around you that are just like you are going through the exact same thing. And so kind of inspiring each other to, to keep working and challenging each other to do more. Well, I know I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be doing this show by myself. Oh, if it wasn't yeah. for you guys, I would like, this would not have lasted <laughs> as long. Cause when you're, I think when you're in it with other people, it's, mm -hmm. there's more riding on it and you don't want to let other people down. And, and you know, you, you feed off of each other's, Definitely. you know, creative, mm -hmm. uh, flow and all that as well. Yeah. And I know for a fact, from my perspective too, like I hadn't filmed anything, original in like forever until i started working with you guys like, yeah I, I don't know that like because it, it's so difficult kind of getting no I, yeah and it, it's true too it's like it, it's difficult kind of maintaining that creative traction when you're doing everything by yourself and you're yeah. like a one-man band but like as soon as i started doing this with you guys it was like so inspiring and it just made me want to work harder and do more and and now we're like consistently filming like every week which is like incredible it's way better than anything i'd done in the past so see that's why i married this guy yeah, you know, like, you know, honey, like <laughs> i'm excited for the rest of our lives to begin yeah. honeymoon phase is not over not no. yet <laughs> <laughs> so so josh i this has been for anyone who can see i don't know i don't think the other camera will pick it up but i mean josh has been in the most uncon uncomfortable position in in craning the uh the boom scissors <laughs> uh arm for the mic to be able to talk this whole time but uh I don't want to keep you too much longer with your hands off the camera uh, so, I mean, if, uh, I just, I had a great time mm -hmm. to sales film festival. I highly recommend, I think they're having another thing soon. I believe so. Uh, the, the documentaries only though, it's the documentary mm -hmm. showcase. Yep. I believe that's happening. I want to say a week or two from now, I think that's look it up, right. Google it. Like the, May, right? Something the, like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. In April. Um, oh, April, right. I'm like, this is uh, <laughs> uh, or don't Google it. It's fine. Uh, but I'm just oh, are you talking to me? No, it's only the I I I, I, the, I, I tuned out, dude. Like, I'm the only one without a computer. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, the the uh, documentary showcase where you will be able to watch the uh, documentary we were referencing about right. the film and and three other documentaries that were also very interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, super fun. Oh, totally. Shout out yeah. to Baron. Professor Barron for uh, yeah, and letting us tag along to that. that shout was out to fun. all the people that worked on stuff. Too. Absolutely. Gosh, talented, man, really talented yeah. people. Mm -hmm. Some really beautiful work that's come out of that. Definitely. Um, and now I want to enter a festival. Yeah, right? Like, I want to do it. Do yeah, I want to make it short. Let's go. Let's do it. I can't do Lab it. 212 for 2019. Freaking why not? I mean, it's we could still do it in 2018. <laughs> it's, the year is pretty, pretty young. <laughs> it's not if I count ourselves young. out. Um, Lab Two Twelve for twenty seventeen <laughs> film festivals. We're doing it. Well, you thought you could make a game in five weeks. So, <laughs> speaking of making a game in Ooh, five weeks, I just learned about this. I didn't know you were the guy. Oh, so that was like the the full circle thing. So, yeah. as a lot of you guys know, we've been talking. Thank you very much, Josh. By the way, Thanks. for speaking. Uh, as a lot of you guys know, for like the past forever, since even before the Christmas break, we were talking about go, uh, Pat and I making a game together with a lot of a uh, team of other people. And to to connect the dots now, David is actually our guest today is in fact the he was the project lead and pretty much the person who got everybody together and had this idea to do a thing and was pretty much the one heading all of that. So, and that's who our guest is today. So for, so, you know, the, the story is coming together for, <laughs> for this narrative of procrastination and just so how can all finally get fail. some closure. Yeah, I like to apologize yeah. for ruining everything. 
Yeah, it so let's get, I mean, let's get down to brass tacks. <laughs> Are there any hard feelings? Because I, <laughs> because Pat, and frankly, I haven't talked to you very much since we came back on purpose because I was avoiding you out of shame. <laughs> That's uh, why. <laughs> Makes a little bit of sense. Um, but yeah, so I mean, like, I'm not as attached to the project as of right now. I don't even know, like, what the status is. I've checked the Discord a few times, but Pat and I fell off. During the break, as a lot of you know, and I'm sure you know, so I mean, like we didn't even talk to each other for five weeks. Yeah, so. no, it was, it was, chance, yeah, it was <laughs> sorry. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. So I mean, what's the status? Like, what's going on? Or do you hate us? Like, what's going on, man? No, no, there's no hard feelings. It's the way teams go sometimes, and especially the group got a little bit larger than it originally intended. So keeping everybody together and keeping schedules going and. Holidays are definitely a hard time to try and, and put something together like that. But I'm still I'm still up for, for doing something, for putting people together, for working. Um, I, you know, it's networking and it's it's fun whether anything comes of it or not. It's still something to do, something to try. And like you were just talking about the film festival, give it a shot and, and see what you can, can make of it. So, no, there's no hard feelings. It's the way it goes sometimes. Definitely, especially with something like this. Yeah, <laughs> that's a load off my chest. Uh, especially with something as complex as making a game from the ground up. You know, like is especially the team of people. Like I had just met ninety percent of the people that we were working with, so it was like it's crazy. Like it was a lot to take in. Right. But it, it was the same way for it was the same way for a lot of the members, and yeah, I, I think there was a collective. It needs to be a little bit more organized just from the stance of we were kind of pressed for time and had a hard time figuring out what we all agreed on as far yeah. as what we wanted to do. So, What's the status of the project right now? What happened? Where are they now? Is the company closed doors? <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone's still... Uh, a lot of the students were from the game design major. They're all still there. So it's just... On hold right now because we obviously have different games that we're working on for class, the things mm -hmm. that we need to do for that. Um, but I'm like I said, I'm still open for anybody who who wants to do any work on it, wants to keep do anything, even if we scratch the whole original idea and come up with something brand new. It like, was pretty large in scope. Me. I think that may have contributed a bit to the apprehension of some people. Well, and the thing is too, like. I can motivate myself, or I can motivate maybe one or two other people, but yeah, I, I but can't. I can't motivate everybody yeah. to do something like I. I took on a. I was doing a personal project. I was doing a game, and in just under a week, I had created an, a huge kind of environment. Now it was just text based, but there's so much thing, so many things in it. Several thousand lines of just code, just pure code. So, but I motivated myself to do it, mm -hmm. and. Especially when it comes with artwork and, and music and all the other aspects that were going into it. It takes some more time, some more networking and, and coordination to be able to come up with something like that. So. Yeah. I love it. Well, right, we have to go to a break. Are we going to go to a break? Okay, okay right. well, when we come back, we're going to talk more with David and video games. So we'll be back. Thank Bye. And we're back. Oh, man, Pat. You know, every week, it seems like... You reach this this point of enthusiasm that's pretty strong, and I feel like, well, next week he's going to be really solid. Then he's going to take that and run with it, and then you just start right back at the beginning, yeah, again, and then gradually through each segment, you gain more and more energy, and then just uh, maybe you should just take over for maybe. that, like just notice when he hits the button. And what then... if we start at the last segment? Then it'll be oh. super energetic. <laughs> we can just do the last segment four times. Oh. You know what? Let's just do the show backwards. Yeah. On a scale from 10 to 0. Oh, I'm so glad that joke died. Uh, did it? Let's bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> how much did you hate it on a scale of 10 to 0? How is everybody's self-esteem? Yeah, how, how are you feeling, Chandler? I am I feel really good, honestly. Wow. Yeah. For the I think it's the first time I've ever answered that I question so. that way. Yeah. But yeah, I feel pretty great. What about you, what about you guys? What's your, your self-esteem at right now? Yeah, middle of the road. I'm fine. It's Monday. Yeah. Monday lowers everybody's self-esteem. We like Mondays here at the Poorly Edited Podcast. It's, it's the only day we exist. It's my busiest day. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Pat? Self-esteem? Yeah. Feeling pretty good about the shirt until you didn't know what it was. So. What is it? It's from Arrested Development. It's a banana stand. Oh, my. 
I don't know how. So I've been watching this show for the past this like, three weeks. Across the top. And I didn't get it. <laughs> like, I've been actively watching this show every night. Okay, well, that's embarrassing. Anyway. Um, yeah, so, da- <laughs> so David, video games. You're a game design major, right? Right. Um, so what brought you to that? I, I can only assume you may have dabbled in some video game playing as a child, perhaps. Yeah, pretty much everyone in that major answers during uh, yeah. the first day of class when we do icebreakers. Yeah, I play video games. Gee, I wonder why you're in a game design major. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I. it started... Many years ago, when I, when I was little, I I like I like to create like tabletop games, board games, and card games and stuff. And one time, someone said to me, "You know, put that on the computer," and, and <laughs> they actually turned it into a, turned it into a video game, programmed it. Who said that? And it was it was well. That sounded like an old person. Like, saying that. Like, put oh, it on the why don't you put that on the computer? I'm, take, I'm taking a lot of words out, but <laughs> that was, that was basically the gist of it. Was it actually Bill Gates. <laughs> so yeah. back to David. <laughs> no, but I mean to see to see a game that I had created on tabletop, and this was when I was younger. Actually, you know, playable on the computer as a video game was that pretty must neat. Have been crazy. To me. It, yeah, it was something something brand new, and um, then at some point in my in my high school career, I kind of switched over from console gaming to PC gaming, and it opened up a whole new world of like mods and and homebrew content and stuff. And and from there, I kind of moved into to editing games, to to adding things to them, to changing the way that they played, so that I I could enjoy it. And I spent so much I spent more time doing that than actually playing the game. <laughs> that I thought maybe I should do maybe I should be making the games for a living. I don't know. So you've I think before the show you said you had an estimated 500 mods made for Civ. Pretty wow. close for for Civilization. I've made yeah, I've made a lot of uh, different mods as far mm. as adding. Most of them are just adding different countries and stuff, but a couple of them do add different units and and things of that nature. I like that you also so you have like three branches. You have like actual countries. You have like his um historical country or not historical, what uh, fantasy countries and then what's the last one? Well, yeah, like, I, I have I have. Uh, fan, fan, fantasy countries, and then I have historical countries that actually existed, um, and then I have countries that I just made up myself that okay. I thought would be interesting to play as. So, yeah, but I between the between the three, the historical countries I have the most of, and I probably am getting around three hundred just for them. So, but I I enjoy just as much as making them. I enjoy like researching them and, and stuff. So. I was going to say that must be a, a pretty big part of the process when you're doing that. Right. And and it's like that for any game, especially if you're going to base it in anything in reality. You have to do a little yeah. bit of research and, and figure out what you want to include, what you don't, what's most important, and, and what aspects really define it. So, yeah, I, I do spend a lot of time as far as researching the countries and, and the people because I want to represent them. I would try to do it the same way that the makers of the game did, represent them in their best light. And, and show them off as they really were a great country in this aspect or that aspect or as a whole. Well, also, you're a pretty big fan of history too, aren't you? Yes, I am. Yeah. That was the sound of my phone dying that, was you. that <laughs> I have charging right now. So sorry about that. Was, that. That's not how it's supposed to work. Well, that's how it works right now. <laughs> it's because I'm trying to charge it off this awful, which by the way, this is a monitor, so I don't even really know how that works for charging, but it's not good. Obviously can, not too well. Yeah. What? Sure. Thanks. Your onset charger getting on it. My onset charger. <laughs> Lizzie's a PA today. Oh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh-huh. thank you. But <laughs> um, so I'm really into Civ. Josh is into Civ. He, that's literally the only game I, I ever see Josh play on Steam. Like he's always he no. gets any free time he gets on Civ Five immediately. You should have a Civ game. We should we edit a podcast. That eats up free time a lot. We, yes. Yeah, yeah, it does. We can use all five thousand of your Civ mods. <laughs> at once. At once. Not, not 5,000. All 5 I thought million. thought it was 5,000. 5 million Civ mods. I don't have that much time. <laughs> okay. Can so we, do they do really well? Like, are they popular? I don't have actually any of them posted because oh, wow. I'm okay. a programmer, not an artist. Okay. So, I mean, I could post them and they play just fine. But, you know, it, it'll show up and it'll be some crude looking, right. looking oh. thing. So, oh, I'm not going to download that. You know, it looks have like you trash. Ever, have, you, <laughs> have you ever thought of teaming up with if? Just a random freelance artist or something, and 
doing that and I, posting I, them? I did at one point, and I kind of progressed to the point, well, now I'm making my own entire games. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, maybe at one point, if the, if the chance comes across, I might hook up with an artist and say, hey, I've got all these mods. Would you mind making art for them? We can post them on Steam. But, I mean, by the time I, I got to the point that I'm at now, the, the newest iteration of Civ has come out, and they're pro it's yeah. not as big of a market for Civ Five. No one plays Civ Six so. anyway. <laughs> That's true. Civ Six is bad. No, I'm what, just kidding. Is it? No, I, I haven't played it. I haven't played it. Uh, but we are right now <laughs> on the. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so you're Enjoy in our game. <laughs> so we'll make uh, it four turns. <laughs> <laughs> we could get through like maybe five turns in the hour span of time that oh, the yeah. podcast runs. Uh, but so you're, what what kind of classes does the program? Uh, well, are you so you're a game design major? Now that has the art and programming tracks for it, doesn't it? Right. There's there's two parts. Uh, there's the programming track and the art track, and they're mm -hmm. kind of separate, but they also intermingle. Mm -hmm. So. You start out in some some basic programming classes and some basic art classes, and as you progress through the through the track, you kind of split up a little bit more, and then you're either program or art centric, and you work with the other side. So I'm at the point now where I'm at the end, and I'm doing all the programming for the games that we're creating, and but I'm working with the artists from the other side. But there was a time where we were all in the same classes, both art and programming. So. That's really interesting. That's actually kind of neat that it splits off like it that and then yeah. you continue to work with each other. Yeah, it's and it's definitely interesting because you get a chance to try both, um, at least at the beginning. And, you know, like I started and I realized I'm not good at art. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm definitely in the right track and keep going with the programming because my, my stick figures won't pass. <laughs> but um, it, it's definitely, I get to try it. And and I still would like to, you know, learn some of the art techniques and, and the way that the artists do their stuff. But I obviously am not anywhere near talented as the art students that are there and able to make some of the art for the programming that I do that they don't even understand. So is so we have programming and art. Are there any other parts to, like, game design, big parts? Oh, yeah. There, I mean, game design really brings together all, all different mediums as far as you have art, you have programming, you have sound design, you have marketing if you go to sell it you have storyboarding and writing and stuff if you want to make anything of that uh there's definitely when you get into bigger games there's there's mathematics and analyzing things and balancing different things is in the games so there's there's definitely a whole bunch of different things that come together in game design it's it's a lot more than just some of the on the surface things of like programming and art there's even a place for film majors because when it comes to cutscenes and animations right. and stuff like that, that's where that comes in. And I know a lot of like film uh, centric people who work in the games industry doing jobs like that. Uh, so yeah, it, it's really an amalgamation of just tons of different creative jobs like that. I mean, there's just a lot of places you can go and a lot that goes into making a game, you know. There's kind of something for any any artist, I would say, that's interested in like the medium. Right. And that was that was another thing that kind of drew me into it because I was like if I if I go into it and start making games and stuff and I realize I'm more like doing the the like the cutscene aspect, I can more quickly shift over to like a film major or if I like doing the sound design for the game, I can switch into some kind of audio major. Or something like that, and I already have experience in doing it, and you know, figuring out what, how much I really like it. So, it game design is a nice one for for computer majors in general because they get a chance at trying a whole bunch of different things, as opposed to to one thing or another. So. I liked what you said about that. You had to do, even though you knew you probably weren't going to be an artist in concentration, that you still did art things early on and dabbled in them to understand how they work. Um, I think it's like important to, especially as someone like you, we're heading a team of people, you know, to make, I'm sure that wasn't the first time you were at the project lead of a, of a gaming project. So I think it's really important, especially from a leadership perspective, to understand and have done every, like a little bit of everything so that you can connect more personally and directly with your artists and with your sound designers and stuff like that. And not just in the game design uh, aspect, but I mean, even as a, myself as a film major, it's important, like, even though I'm not a musician, I'm, you know, to take 
music classes so i understand you know the the sound and music of what goes into film and and the writing even though it might not be exactly what you're planning on doing it's good to understand how all of it works you know it gives you a broader um knowledge base that you can connect with everyone involved right and the, and the track here is is definitely special in that you go through and you learn your your programming and your art and and whatever else is is for just for the game design but also take i took classes in like project management and and user experience design where it's not so much cent centered on a video game itself or a game in general, but in being able to lead a team that's going to design that or being able to make customers happy. And that was one of the things with, with our project. It's one of the first times that, you know, really got to try it and really put it into use. And, you know, you learn something from it and you, you got to learn from your mistakes and your failures and, and move on and, and try to do better the next time. Definitely. On that note, we're going to a break. Good. Already, wow, right. that's, that's how I like it. Every it's the same amount of time every time, guys. <laughs> and we're back. Oh, that was pretty good. Let's up on that. Uh, so they're swapping out batteries behind me over my head, and now Zach Literally has the camera. What's going on? Uh, so when we were during the break, uh, I was commenting on Patrick who queues up all the ads for every break because he runs the board, and I was saying, Why do you play? We were all making fun of him. Why do you play such weird, obscure ads in foreign languages and stuff? And he's like, it doesn't matter. I'm like, of course it matters. It's going to make people turn the show off because they don't understand. And he's like, oh, yeah, like the ads are what's going to make people turn the show off. Like, honestly, I think we're I think we do a good enough job steering people away. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so while you guys put new batteries and things, are you guys OK now? OK, are good. Done? Uh, <laughs> uh, David, here's a real, there's I think right now, especially with some current event things going on in the gaming industry, which, by the way. The industry right now, I respect you for wanting to get into th that uh, medium because from my perspective, like I was really interested in game design when I first came to college. I was a programming major when I first started here uh, because I did uh, programming in trade school before that. And I was always making games in trade school with all my free time and for all my final projects. So I was like, I wanted to be a game designer. Like that was my first thing first career that I wanted to go for and I eventually changed to film pretty quickly but uh, uh, I think the industry right now like gaming industry is pretty is on shaky ground it seems like in terms of just overall when it comes to AAA and and the which AAA is essentially what you would expect from the mainstream companies for anyone who isn't familiar like you the have big boys the, the big the big dogs in town like electronic arts and activision and you know the people who make your call of duties and and things like that um and uh, it just there's been a lot of unrest in the communities and the fan bases of everything things are it just seems like a darker time. I feel like the golden age of playing Halo 3 and Modern Warfare 2 on Xbox Live are long, long behind us. And now I'm just, just in this weird, weird state. And so what's your what's your feeling on AAA versus the more, you know, kind of homey and... Independent. Down-to-earth, yeah, independent mm -hmm. development processes. It's definitely a, a mixed bag. I mean, you have your pros and your cons for both. Uh, I think AAA definitely has a lot of advantages, and they've been around for a while, and, and they definitely have a lot more resources. But they've taken bad raps in some of the things that they've done recently as far as microtransactions and their treatment of certain fan bases. And, and so people don't necessarily want to support companies like that anymore. But now we have the indie scene where it's getting real big for, for individual people to make their own video games and to release them. And they have their own pros and cons as well. They generally have smaller but more dedicated fan bases. But at the same time, it's, there's generally one or one or more, just a few group, a small group of people working on, on a game. So it takes them longer and they don't generally get as much accomplished and they don't have the resources that a AAA company would have. I feel like just like in the film industry, just like in the music industry and just in, in, in games as well, it's like the best and worst time to want to be it doing it because it's the easiest it's ever been to get into it. 
and the easiest it's ever been to like have that platform. I mean, you can make a game, get it greenlit on Steam for like a hundred dollars or something right. to pay for the license, and like it, it can just snowball from there. You have Game Jolt to host like tons of indie projects and just all kinds of outlets like that. And but at the same time, it's like the worst because you have costs rising in the the game industry that's leading to shady business practice like uh crowdfunding not uh coming true on their promises and fulfilling you know promises on games and and deadlines and you have uh triple a developers doing things like putting microtransactions in games that affect gameplay that people don't like and are very vocal about but they don't care and they just keep pushing and ruin the fun and all kinds of stuff like that like and it just seems to be in a very weird uh state right now and so i think uh, I think what what's possible with indie now, seeing like how we just saw Cuphead and the success they had there. I mean, those guys were what they were like mortgaging their houses, um, again to pay for in hopes that Cuphead would be successful because they believed in it so much and it spent so much time on it, and then it, it finally got big and now they're just rolling in dough and that sure. and success stories like that make it seem very uh, the outlook is very bright you know on the indie scene and undertale as well is another great example i mean toby fox made that entire game by himself and l- all the success that that's garnered for what seems like such a simple game and you don't need you know it's b- become very apparent like you don't need the EAs and the Activisions and all the money and all the bells and whistles to necessarily garner attention and to be a successful game developer. And that's, like, really exciting, I would imagine, for, especially for someone like you. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, the indie scene is definitely unique. And compared to the to the AAA, they they don't have the all the same things that the AAA have. But what they do have is a serious dedication to create something. And when they do get recognized and they do become big, like something like you mentioned in, in Cuphead, they obviously get their payout. But it, it takes so much to be able to get to that point, and to you have to stay optimistic and and keep working toward it, toward it to be able to get there. Because if a AAA company has a flop, then they already have a backlog of stuff to be able to to say, okay, that game didn't make us much money, but we still have enough money to keep going. Whereas an indie a, a flop that they spent five, ten years working on could be the end of it for them because they don't have enough money or time to continue to try to make something else. Yeah, that's and that's really that's scary. Like it's it's really scary to be indie in that. But you know, I think if, with things to to gain funding, I, I think crowdfunding has become like a really. I know I just spoke negatively about it a second ago, but it has you know it's it's. Uh, light and dark side to it but I, I think like crowdfunding is a great great way for projects to get off the ground that things are getting made that literally would never have found the money to get made and seen the light of day previously but because there's this platform these platforms like indiegogo and stuff like that uh, uh, that and kickstart that allow you know people to find their support and for people to willingly give money to them. Now uh, that kind of comes at the cost of those developers could just literally never finish the game. And then uh, you don't get your money back usually. And then you're just kind of burned, but you know, it's, it's buyer beware, I guess to support that. I think that is actually with the system shock Two remake that they were working. I think it's the second one they're remaking crowdfund- crowdfunded. It is it, it, it yes, it's crowdfunded except they've run into a pro. I don't really know exactly. I feel like I just heard about it a few weeks ago. They ran into issues of scope and things like that, and the team has pretty much put the project on a bit of a halt for the moment. It seemed like it was fine, like because they were releasing tech demos and it seemed like functional and everyone was getting super excited and they hit all their monetary goals and crowdfunding. And then all of a sudden they just come out of the, out of the blue and they're like, yeah, it's not, nah, it's not looking good. We might have to get back to the drawing board on some things. And it's like, what? You know, so everyone got really confused and upset at that. And I'm pretty beside myself because I was really looking for it. It looks so cool. Uh, to get to replay that game, a masterpiece. That was the precursor to Bioshock, you know? That's a weird thing to 
like have too big of a scope on a remaster too. Yeah. Like, well, how big of a scope could you have more than the game? They were doing some what crazy were they stuff. Doing? <laughs> well, I think they were redesigning um parts of levels to be more I don't know how much you know about it, David. Uh I don't know about that game specifically. Mm. But. I think they're they're redesigning portions of levels to just be have a better user experience and things like that. So you know, it wasn't a complete just reskin with better graphics and stuff like that. They were really getting back to the meat and potatoes of things for that remaster. But yeah, so you know, examples like that. I mean, that could happen with anything, and and that's scary with crowdfunding that you know your money could essentially be wasted and they can just I mean they say that they're coming back like they say it's not that situation at all and they're not just going to take the money and run um but we don't really know uh but like you said I mean it's it's has the potential it, like it creates an opportunity for games to be made that would never be picked up by a triple a developer anymore like I, I like an old school CRPG sort of thing like yeah. Pillars of Eternity was completely crowdfunded the sequel was completely crowdfunded like instantly met their goal like stuff like that which we never would be able to see those kind of games but now they're like we know that there's a demand for it the yeah. money's there for anyone who's familiar with Psychonauts and Double Fine to have Tim Schafer fame uh, I uh, Psychonauts 2 had been people had wanted Psychonauts 2 forever and Tim Schafer's like well, you know, no one wants to pick the game up and then he's like, I, you know what, we'll just crowdfund it. And then and they started the campaign for that. That was uh, maybe half a year ago or something. I'm not sure what the status is of Psychonauts 2 now uh, and, like, where its campaign is at. But I felt, I, if I remember correctly, it was hitting its marks pretty well because it has a very decent cult following, I would say. Um, but, yeah, and that's crazy because that's someone who worked in, you know, pretty high on the rungs in the gaming industry. I mean, that's a that's a big company, what Double Fine was. And, uh, or is it People Can Fly? I'm sh I'm sorry, I might be wrong on that. I'm not sure, because Tim Schafer's all over the place. But, yeah, so, and that's, like, crazy that someone from up there was like, you know what, I'm going to go to the indie, you know, standpoint of things, and we'll see if, if a big studio publisher doesn't want to pick it up, then we'll, we'll see if you guys do, you know, as the fans. And, like, that's, so that's really interesting. Um, but... Are you are you more interested in doing everything indie? Like, is that where you, it is? Double fine. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, is indie where you want to be? Do you want to be your own uh, you entity? Want, you know. Do you want to hang Veld Studios one day? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or or are you do you have your sights set on like I want to work for. Bioware or Bungie or like what's you know I don't know why you do that. Ew, Bungie yeah, I you know Bioware three years ago I would have been ecstatic to be near Bungie but they have really not been doing well with Activision and I feel like it's mostly Activision's fault for like pigeonholing them on some things but I feel like it's definitely not just Activision Activision fault. has in fact come out and said like it's Bungie's fault entirely and that they're being really incompetent about a lot of things either. yeah so it's like a he said she said I oh man they really sold them their souls to the devil there like they had lightning in a bottle and they're just like no it's ruin ruin this I guess <laughs> no, I, I'm happy to to be doing any kind of work with it I mean I just enjoy doing it so if I'm in working for a triple-a company or working indie at this point in my life, it's not that important to me. The issue is uh, that right now on this in this part of the world, the the eastern U.S. isn't doesn't have too many big AAA companies nearby. There's a few, but most of what's around here is indie. So I would either have to move elsewhere or go indie. And I mean, there's pros and cons of both. Like I said, and I really do enjoy the aspect of indie where I can do what I want, and there's nobody to stop me nothing other than my wallet and my imagination. So whereas AAA, I have the the ability to be part of something big and something great and something that, you know, people look at and they see on TV and the commercials and like, wow, that's awesome. And that looks like a lot of fun. But at the same time, like I said, Indy, I have the, the choice to do what I want and go in any direction. Yeah. Uh, speaking on like uh, you mentioned location, and it's, it's interesting how many parallels there are between like both – uh, you know, as a film major, uh, and I, Zach, you're a film major as well. Josh is. Um, nothing. Uh, you don't have to tell us about moving. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like we totally understand about the location thing. Although I, I can say that in uh, 
rally in North Carolina actually is becoming a bit of a, I heard about this a few year or so ago. Um, it's becoming a bit of a hotspot for like the tech industry and, on the East Coast. And in fact, I don't know if you're familiar with Cliff Blazensky, who was from uh, lead designer of Epic Games, uh, who did Gears of War and Unreal Tournament and stuff. He branched off. He left Gears of War and Epic uh, before Judgment came out and then went and founded Boss Key Productions, who made Lawbreakers. Which I Ooh. think just came. Hey, well, let's chill out. Oh. But it's their first thing. But uh, uh, I heard good things about it. I haven't heard anything negative about Lawbreakers. Anyway, I can I can give you something negative. Sure. Give me a second. Hit me. Uh, and so they made Lawbreakers, and they're actually based in Raleigh, North Carolina. So uh, there's definitely some like it's. I think it's a lot slower to grow here, but I think there's definitely jobs, and I I feel like Raleigh is probably going to see more potentially more studios spring up there because i guess like just the real estate there is just it's really like really nice it's not as expensive as it would be to go out west or something like silicon valley or something like that where the tech industry is really booming um go on all right so <laughs> <laughs> pat's been waiting for that oh yeah uh, but i hate lawbreaker so much i've never even no, played I, it i've I, only watched I, gameplay I played it was all right I, what are the I chances of this is something stupid no come on hit me no hit me lawbreaker is the average player is in the last 30 days has been 5.1 in a strictly multiplayer what do you, game. Five point one. Online, there's been 5.1 players on average. That's good. That's pretty that's, good. That's like half a team. How does that on work? One, it doesn't. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> like the peak in the last 30 days was 25 players. That's like two servers. What's that going on? There are more than 5.1 people in this room. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if we all got on Lawbreakers, we'd be more than average. We'd have more people more, on more than the average player base. Yeah. I'm pretty sure Halo Three still has more concurrent players. No, wait, did they stop the servers for Halo Three? Uh, I feel like that happened. Yeah, I feel like that happened already. Let me check. Um, but well, that's kind of depressing. I don't really know how that happens. No, I do know how it happens. I well, no, go on. I bet that feels good. What? Oh <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's interesting though, because you know, it's not like Cliff. Blazinski doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah, I don't know. It was really so, weird. I thought it was a solid game too. Like it definitely had its like niche that like it could totally fill. But I don't know. Well, you know what I think it is. I think it's uh, a victim of timing. I don't think it was the right time for a game like that. You have Overwatch that is just killing it in the first-person shooter. Um, competitive kind of scene. You have CSGO, which is still very, very prevalent. And now you have the uh, Battle Royale games like PUBG and Fortnite that are taking the casual community of uh, shooter players. Uh, bye, Josh. Bye, Josh, Josh. Has to, he, Josh has to go to his better job now. And we're going to say bye to him. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah, so I feel like it's a victim of, of like timing. That just isn't... It isn't the, the right time for a game like that to come out and for it to gain a lot of traction. I feel like people got pretty burned out and of that genre, of the shooter genre, because it was very prevalent years ago. And Like you said, the market's just it's settled. Like, yeah. They have their place for the different corners of it. it and it's, uh, you know, I don't know, man. I don't know if it's because I'm getting older or and I have less time or if it's just genuinely. I kind of feel like it's a... Good combination of both, uh, if, or if it's just that games suck more now. Because <laughs> every time I, there's very few things I play anymore that I just don't hate, or or I, I don't pick out tons of glaring air issues and stuff like that. Like playing PUBG like hurt me all the time because of how buggy and glitchy. Like I would just complain constantly. Like I cannot stand things like that. And and the and the early access kind of early alpha stuff that keeps getting pushed out onto Steam and these early access games. Like, I, it's just, I don't know, man. It just, it is not my style, you know? I, I really, I feel old, but I miss the, like... I miss Halo 3. I miss Halo. <laughs> I, I miss when Call of Duty wasn't totally bad, and uh, I don't know, man. Just, I, I, you well... Can so you can think about that more on a break. Good. I'm gonna do that. I didn't want to say it anyway. Good. And we're back. <gasps> so David, what were you saying? <laughs> what were you gonna say before Pat rudely interrupted you oh, for that Pat ad break? Rude. 
Uh, all I was going to say was the the game the gaming industry has definitely changed since the times of like Halo Three, where I mean now we've come to expect more from games, and there's a lot more players, and we're a little older, and well, at least we are, <laughs> and older. we don't want to put up with the bugs. We want to when we pay sixty dollars for a game, we want it to work, and we want to be able to play it. But also, game companies are put in a different position than when they first started out because mm-hmm. now they're, you know, especially the AAA companies, they're pressured to be able to put out so many games a year and have, you know, so many returns, so many returns and profits that they're making money or they're not going to be making money and they're going to go under just like indies that don't, that aren't making any money. So it's, it's definitely changed not just the community around video games, but also the, the way that the video game companies react to the community and the way that they have to. Uh, continue on to make money and to continue to stay in business. What it's, I th- uh, something, no, you go. I was, what I think is cool is that. Uh, wait, do you, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to change subjects. So if you have something oh, else to say about it, well, I was just going to say um, it's it's an interesting predicament that we find ourselves in because I feel as though the cost of creating the games that satisfy the h- very high expectations of the consumers right now which I can even say is usually unrealistically high, like insanely the the expectations is like, oh, uh, No Man's Sky is going to it's gonna solve world hunger and make me happy forever. It's just mean, end, endless gameplay and stuff like that. And it didn't deliver on things that it should have, but it also was never going to live up to the amount of hype. You know, when you put things on a pedestal right from the beginning like that before you even see gameplay, like it's bound to, to dissatisfy you. So like... There's a lot of that going on, and I, the cost of making those games has increased so much. I mean, the technology that it takes, the man hours that it takes. I mean, everything looks beautiful and, and plays smooth and, and everything like that, and that costs more than it did 10 years ago yeah. to make those games, yet game prices have stayed the same price in that amount of time. And I, so we see more things like companies going, how do we, I, how do we make more money then? Like, I don't know. So they're doing microtransactions, they're doing loot boxes, you know, and things. And sometimes the consumers don't like it. Sometimes they don't care. Sometimes they do care. And it's just some weird dice roll. Like there's microtransactions that are exactly like the ones we saw in say Battle for Star Wars Battlefront 2 that just came out that are uh, involve changes to gameplay. You know, you can buy your way to success uh, with real money. And and there's other games that did that but did not get as hated on as Battlefront 2 did. And you're just kind of scratching your head like, well, what makes it okay in that situation but not this one? And why, you know? And I feel like developers are really getting backed into a corner of just being afraid to try to keep their heads above water. Not saying that all these companies are in you know, have any chance of going under, you know, in the case of like EA or something like that, I don't think they're going anywhere that they need to do this, but it is something to think about of being as a consumer, are your expectations really where they should be? You know, are you, are you expecting a reasonable product and keeping a level head about that, not going to uh, burn every developer at the stake for, you know, some little minute detail that they didn't have, you know, to your exact liking. Um, and as a consumer, it sucks because you don't want to pay more. You don't want to pay more for your game and you want to buy a game for $60 and have the game be finished, have a complete product that you can enjoy like the good old days, you know? I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think I've spent 60 bucks on a game since I was like <laughs> 12. Yeah, I, I can't even remember. Why? Because there's so much, especially the PC, and there's just so much good content that's cheaper. You just I wait. agree. You know, it yeah. all gets cheaper. Yeah. So if like a sixty dollars game comes out, I'm like that looks sweet, I'll buy it in like six months when it's on sale. The game I've had the most fun on, like in the last year probably, that I like have enjoyed the most consistently has been Warframe, and that game's free, yeah. and it is done very fine. Uh, and they have tons of content rolling out. They just had a huge uh, open world update that they came out with, and that's an independent company who's been you know doing all that themselves and uh, only getting money from the people who want to buy their their in game content out of their own will. And they even their slogan is "Ninjas play for free," like so like so they're in fact like uh, saying 
you know, saying it's okay to not pay them any money, like, in their tagline. Yeah, I've had the same exact experience for the last year, just mm-hmm. like you with Path of Exile. Yeah. It's the same exact platform. Yep. And then the, the the other thing I can think of that I've enjoyed immensely, like a game that I just I love to to its core was Undertale that I played a few years ago when it came out, and that game is what twenty dollars. You know, I think I don't now think I think it's now. Well, when I when I got it, my I was yeah, and and that, it's like you know, I don't know. I, I'm definitely not clocking in tons of hours on Call of Duty World War Two. These days, you know, or Destiny 2. Uh, that's for darn sure. <laughs> but, yeah. Pat, you want to talk about esports? Yeah. Well, what about fun, esports? I, uh, I was mostly going to talk about there's this thing that happened this week where they made like an esports arena in Las Vegas. That's like the first thing. It's like, this is only for playing video games. That's interesting. It was really weird though, because they like, it seemed like. An investor's idea of what people who play video games would like as opposed to a person who plays video games idea of what people who play video games would like. I'm not surprised by that. Yeah, what no. makes you say that, though? Do you there's, not think you there's, a there's a good a, enough... You know how there's a ribbon-cutting ceremony? Yes. Well, this one, they took two, like, extension... They made, like, two huge mock-up extension cables and plugged them into each other, and that was the opening of it. That doesn't sound like... I feel like, like you're nitpicking. <laughs> Am I? I don't know. I do. But that that might may not have been the best example, but I believe Pat. Like, they also, I, like the so they were like, this is huge. This is gonna be a huge night in esports. We're okay. gonna get, we're gonna get a Smite show match. We're gonna get a Rocket League show match, and we're gonna get an FGC show match. I don't, you don't think Rocket League is? I don't think big? any of those games are big enough to be like this is the biggest oh, thing so- that happens. Oh, I'm sorry that the other games like CS:GO and Overwatch already have their own leagues that they're no, not going to be show match. It wasn't a league. Yeah, but they they've really cornered their markets and and anybody who's anybody that's playing for those games like League or uh I just said the other two and I can't remember. Overwatch. Uh yeah, Overwatch and uh CS:GO, they all have their own leagues and those those pros and the people who are big in those scenes, they're not going to go to some dumb show they match. Could have gotten, they could have gotten Hearthstone players. I think it would have been a bigger deal. I see I don't They could have easily knocked down two Counter-Strike teams that are like lower tier that people would have watched more. I don't know, it was weird. Uh, it's kind of like when you go on Twitch and like on the front page, there's these like game commentators in suits, and you're like, relax. It's Viva Pinata. Like, chill out. All right? <laughs> oh, That's good reference. <laughs> Viva Pinata. Good reference. Uh, the, I mean, the arena itself looked really cool. That part seemed like I, the, like if I was ever in Vegas for whatever reason, I'd totally check it out. It looked really cool. It was like tiered. It had like the stage, and then off the side, you could play games on their computers. That was that was something I was reading about, and I actually wrote a, a paper about recently. It was about esports arenas and. And the dilemma between, you know, making it so that people will want to come versus sit at home. Because, I mean, we have Twitch and we have YouTube and we can sit and we can watch these things as they're broadcast online from the comfort of our own home. So why should we come out to these esports arenas to watch the games in, you know, an arena with a bunch of other people and, you know, expensive food and this and that. And the thing, why do I want to pay to go there when I can do it more comfortably at home for free? Uh, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> I feel like I don't know. I feel like the so the physical social aspect of you think way back in the day, uh, you had LAN parties. There was no oh, just hop online and hit me up on Steam or Xbox Live and let's game. It was like I'm bringing my Xbox to your house and we're gonna play on Blood Gulch on Halo Combat Evolved in our living room all together and like that was lit. And and those land parties like are not nobody does that anymore unless for the novelty almost of it to be like and I you know I just my friends and I just did it uh over like last semester we all got our PCs together and we all went up into like uh, my friend's Pat's attic. house? No, no, no. Okay, because no. this is exactly what happened at Pat's house. No, it was more people than that. That was only like three of us. Right, there yeah, was yeah, yeah. there was like <laughs> five of us or six of us yeah. that were all running rigs. I mean, we eventually flipped the breaker in the room, uh, but because <laughs> nice. we were running a space heater and everything, it was awful. It was, we were like, oh, we forgot that could happen. Uh, but yeah, and they, and I would probably have answered this question, like answer this kind of position differently if I hadn't just experienced this recently, but it was so fun to like all be in the same, after playing games online for so long, it was so different and fun to just everyone be in the same place 
and to be like playing Overwatch together, running competitive matches, and to be able to like high five each other after like a sick play that somebody just made like that, and, and like just screaming and getting rowdy like all together like it it's really really unique That's and strange. unlike the experience you can get online. And I think that to, to give a place and a platform for gamers to get out and be social and like have that interaction, I think is really cool. And I bet the more old school gamers who were doing the LAN parties from from their living rooms, inviting 20 people over and, and making food and stuff like that would have probably enjoyed there to be like a more public space to host things like that, like we're getting now. I mean, I agree, but I think I was going somewhere else with it. And even David was going somewhere else with it. Where I like that, it's different when you're playing the game versus watching the game. No, I, yeah, definitely. So, like... For me, like how how close would something have to be for you to go watch? Like if there was like an Overwatch League stadium, how close would it have to be for you to go and like watch a match? Do you think? Probably, like, I would go to it. That would be the equivalent of like where would I go for probably a concert? Like the distance I would travel for like a concert. It's kind of like the same deal. You know, you're going to like some show uh, that you want to see uh, for entertainment and like as a social like thing. So, I mean, you know, like Philly, Allentown, you know, like I'd probably go pretty far. I think that'd be a really cool, because I've never actually been to a huge tournament. So, I think that'd be really cool to experience. Um, but, yeah, and, and just to have a place where you can, I know my friend who uh, was like an amateur pro uh, gamer, he went to a lot of land tournaments and stuff. He lives in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And they have an arena there, like, in their city. So he could just go there with his team that he, like, is locally, you know, practices with. And they would just compete in lands, like, every few weeks and, and stuff like that and, like, win tournaments. And I think that's really cool. I think it'd be really cool to have more of that going on where there's a local place. that's And that place is, like, just for that. You know, it's like a, a, a land center for gaming i i do believe and so i think that's really cool and it, it would be really cool to see more of those popping up you know all over the place and and for people to to go there and compete and and build that <laughs> the camera turned off and to build that uh that that whole scene that is non-existent here i mean there's i don't know anywhere really that you can go do that here you know it's not happening i mean either uh, i know we've been playing or for we've been doing this for too long Oh, it's back. What happened? Oh, she just hit the button? Wow. She's it's not magician. recording. It's not recording, though. I'm sorry. I can't see the button. I mean, You're I, a great I, PA. I wouldn't bother at this point. <laughs> no, I'm being, I'm not being sarcastic. Yeah, just hit it. Or don't. Anyway, I'm, I'm Look, excited for the growth of esports. I am, too. I, I feel weird that you're the one who's kind of talking a little down on it because I figured you of all people. You're the biggest, probably the biggest gamer out of the three of us, I would say, oh. now. Like you still play the most yeah, that's true. out of the three of us, I should say, um, and yeah. So I, I feel weird that you're the one that's talking the most negatively. I, I also about. don't like that kind of thing where it's like super, like I don't know. It, it it looks like super fake or like someone like was just trying to cash in on something, as opposed to like genuine, like someone who actually cared about esports was like, I'm gonna make something that people want to go to and hang out at. I well, think I, it was. I don't know. It might have just been like the money behind it, talking, trying to get something out of it. I think it's a good start. Yeah, I agree. You know, I think I'm, it's a, yeah. I'm excited to, work, to see where it goes from here to get more. Like that place in Tennessee you're talking about, that sounds yeah. sweet. Yeah. To just go somewhere and hang out. I don't know. We're getting closer than I thought we would in the, the, the span of time is shorter than I thought it would be where we're seeing like you can get a scholarship to play on an esports team for a college. Like that's right. happening right now. Like that's not even like yeah. a and I, I was talking about this a few years ago, and I was like, "Oh, way down the line, that's going to be a thing that's happening." But it's already happening. Like it's so much faster than I thought it would be. And to be watching when the Overwatch League came out, and to see the production value that goes behind that, and and just how much of a market there is for esports, and how far the competitive scene for competitive video games w can go is really interesting and it's really exciting and I think it's a better time than ever to want to 
whether you're a, a participant or, you know, a spectator, I think it's only going to get bigger. Right. And I think that's really exciting because one day I want to be able to, as someone who doesn't watch sports very often, I want to be able to have conversations about the la- last night's esports game uh, just like people talk about, you know, last night's basketball game or baseball game or, and whatnot. I think that's a really interesting future. All right, on that note, I think we have to wrap up. Good. So, where can we find you, Chandler? Where can you find me? (sighs) Sly Elliot on everything. Yeah. (laughs) Everything. That's my tagline. Uh, That's it, I think. Yeah, we're making a new track with Ryan Flynn. Coming soon. (laughs) Almost done. Quantize Girl. We're working on it again today, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, And more videos on the way as well. You can check out the gram. Uh, <laughs> clap sync. I'm on Instagram now. Sorry. Good. You can check out our channel, Poorly Edited Podcast. Are we room 212 yet? Not yet. Nice. We're Poorly Edited Podcast on YouTube. So if you like this here for some reason, you can check us out there. <laughs> you you want to plug anything, David? Or you just... All right. David what about your what, what about your GitHub account? I don't so know. everyone can see your Git. No, nah, I don't have one. Really? Really. Have you ever used GitHub? Nope. It's really, as a programmer, really awesome. I you should look into it. I haven't been in the position where it's been useful for me yet. So, right. Like I said, starting with group projects. Is, mm, is it's not just for me. group projects. I realize that. I yeah. realize that. But at this point, that I'm not like in a, a conversation point where I have off air. So, right. <laughs> I have to cut you off. Well, thank you guys so much for watching and listening and have a great day, night. See us next week. See you. Bye. Monday. Same Monday. Time, Monday. 4 Monday. PM. Bye. Bye.